or you know, <laughs> guys just can also. <laughs> awesome, I, I, I like that. Um, so, welcome. Uh, today I'm chatting with Parakana, who is a futurist, geopolitical strategist, author, just general intellectual, who thinks about the future from a very high altitude. He holds a PhD from the London School of Economics, a couple of degrees from Georgetown. He traveled the world really wildly, um, speaks endless number of languages, and runs a company that's called Future Map. So what's not to like? We'll be chatting uh, today with Parag about his latest book, Move, which talks about, you wouldn't believe it, the movement of people, migration, the need of the population of the world to move, to adjust to new realities. So great to be chatting with you today, Parag. Simon, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Thank you. And, uh, you know, I couldn't forgive uh, myself if I didn't use maps in order to uh, to start this conversation, because your books feature maps left, right and center, which is how I first uh, got to know your work. And we'll just start uh, today's discussion with one of my favorite maps of yours. Um, if you could quickly talk us through what this uh, what this shows and what it might mean from a, a population migration uh, perspective. Well, this is certainly one of the scariest maps, uh, whether one loves it or hates it, uh, is sort of secondary. When this was first published in Connectography, and each time I would put this on social media, it would immediately go viral. I work with the British magazine, The New Scientist, uh, to produce this map. And what it does is to show the geographies uh, for organic agriculture if global temperatures rise on average four degrees Celsius. So if you imagine what the world agricultural map will look like after we cross four degrees Celsius, what it is showing you is that the current largest geographies of food production, United States, Brazil, India, China, Australia, will be desertified by then. And Canada and Russia and Scandinavia will be the agricultural superpowers. Now, this is a significant shift from today's landscape, of course. We do see that in a gradual way, this process has begun. Canada and Russia are agricultural superpowers. They are looking at growing soybeans now in these countries. Wheat has been abundant already for a while. The critical thing for people to remember, Simon, when looking at this is that this is not today and it's not tomorrow. It's a gradual transition. Right. And there will be aspects of this that are correct and incorrect. And there are many things that are not explained in such a simple depiction. You know, the role of forests and many other things and obviously the role of technology. Right. We can do uh, cell based and plant based meat and hydroponic and aquaponic agriculture. We might still be able to feed people. But here is the interesting thing, Simon. Where are the people? Because if you look at this green brown transition line, you're looking at roughly, you know, a 40 plus degrees latitude. North of that line, there are, if I'm not mistaken, well under one, there are about you know, 100 million people or so, or a little bit more than 100 million people. If you go further north to the Arctic Circle, 66 degrees latitude, north of that line, there's less than 10 million people. So whereas the population of the world is 8 billion people and rising. So we need to think not just about where we grow food, but what does this tell us about the future of our human geography? And that is the big question that I try to tackle in the book. And I'll stop sharing the map for now, but it's really the interesting question uh, that comes up from a very Western perspective, where we talk about climate change only having losers. We only hear about the catastrophes that climate change will create around the world. But if I'm looking at this map, and I'm being very cynical about this, and I'm, uh, you know, let's say I'm running Russia or I'm running Canada, how much should I worry about climate change? Shouldn't I be happy that I finally have my, uh, you know, a couple of uh, decades in the spotlight soon? <laughs> well, there's winners and there's losers, no question on a global scale, because most of the world's population uh, is currently located in areas that are brown, you know, on that map that are being desertified rapidly, where the livability is declining. So when people talk about climate change apartheid, they are correct. In terms of the winners, there's pros and there's cons. If you look at uh, Russia today and Canada today, 
they literally cannot control their forest fires, especially in Russia and parts of Siberia, in the large eastern provinces and regions, because they don't have the infrastructure and the public services in these remote parts of the country. And the, 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 uh, the heat and the smoke and the, and the emissions, the carbon emissions from the Siberian forest fires have now reached the North Pole. So the idea that suddenly this vast you know, wilderness and forest will suddenly be turned into productive agriculture, it's a long way from where they are now to where they could be. And of course, the climate is a very complex ecosystem. When you chop down the rainforest, you're actually contributing, or not the, the rainforest, the boreal forest, you're contributing to climate change even further. Now, you could plant farmland if the soil will tolerate it, which is an entirely separate issue and challenge as well. And that might uh, elevate your albedo effect because you'll have more light reflection from snow cover over agricultural land. But the point is, this is so complex. When I, when I set out to write the book, I thought, let me answer the question, where will we live in 2050? And the movement of people from south to north is the big story. And we can be fairly confident as to which countries will be winners and losers. In reality, there is so much uh, complexity and the challenges even of, in winning places. For example, if lots of people move to a place that's winning, they might ruin that place and then people will want to leave that place. So the conclusion I came to is that, you know, even in the winners, amongst the winners, there will be a lot of circulation of people because not every country that is a winner can cope with mass migration or even has the money to retrofit its infrastructure, to terraform these remote geographies the way Russia would have to do. But when it does come to migration right now, there's also no question that uh, Canadian immigration policy and Russian immigration policy are night and day. The two largest countries in the world that occupy most of the green space in a high temperature rise scenario have polar opposite immigration strategies. Canada is importing more people as a share of its population than any country in the world. And it's doing so in a progressive fashion, in a consensus fashion, in a, a fashion that is supported by the society, 400,000 new net migrants every year. Russia, of course, needless to say, is not a pro-immigration country. Uh, I report in the book about Russia and conversations with Russian officials and how they're accepting the need for migrant labor, but they're not exactly handing out passports and hugging new migrants when they land the way Justin Trudeau does at Toronto Airport. And what would be the best strategy for a Russia? Because if I'm thinking about just language barriers, it is much easier for me to set up a new life in Canada uh, than to go to Russia. Surely there is a just a cultural uh, dip, uh, hurdle that is larger to take uh, if I transition into, into Russia. Right. But, you know, as you know, Simon, from all of the maps that you uh, share with the world, uh, you know, when it comes to human geography, most of the human population is in Eurasia. Most of the world population is a lot closer to Russia than it is to Canada. And Canada's immigration system is a points based, skills based migration system. And the average person or, or the median person in Arab country or Pakistan or Southeast Asia, if they are forced to become climate refugees, they aren't necessarily university graduates with a 40 point score on the Canadian immigration scale, whereas Russia needs farmers and construction workers and so forth. And one of my hypotheses in the book is that quite a few of the South Asian, meaning Indian and Pakistani and Bangladeshi construction workers who have been working in the Gulf countries for the last 40 years, many of them, potentially millions of them over time, whether it's Indonesians to Pakistanis, right, will eventually find their way into this former Soviet Union, you know, into Russia, into Kazakhstan, into other geographies in that broader space of Eastern Eurasia in order to help to cultivate, uh, whether it's the agriculture or to build new settlements, to rehabilitate the infrastructure. And again, on the ground from my travels in exactly these regions of Siberia, I've spoken to the mid-level and you know, lower level provincial officials, and you hear a very different story than you hear for in Moscow. In these remote regions, what they tell me is, 
We need people. We're trying to attract these people. We even want to bring them into our universities so that we can get them to learn Russian and be functionally operating in the society because we will not have an, an economy if we are not, in a way, engaged in our own resurrection. Uh, so when you say, you know, let's say you're a Russian or a Canadian official, and you're saying, wow, I'm a winner, what's not to like? You still have to make it happen. You have to make those investments. And that is a not just a small policy. It has to be the overriding national priority to be a country that is climate adaptable and to absorb people that are adapting to climate change. And that already leads us to, to the next question here around um, what entities are actually important in managing this? Is the national uh, state uh, actually the right the right vehicle through which to manage this? If the if the force uh, or the the internal desire of people to move to a certain uh, corner of the globe is, is just so big, how much can a national government actually do in order to stop this? Well, it's so interesting. If we think about climate change and migration, these are two of many areas where we have a collective action problem among the governments of the world. Right now, we're trying to get governments to agree to regulate greenhouse gas emissions and other kinds of uh, environmental hazards in order to uh, you know, mitigate climate change. That's proving to be very difficult and very slow. When it comes to migration, this is the area that is most sacrosanct it is the area of sovereign writ that has least been impinged upon by the entire process of multilateralism of the past 100 years. In other words, there are many countries in the world where you don't really control your currency, your interest rates, your laws. It's written by Brussels or there's international treaties. But migration, Simon, human migration, who gets to move across the border is the one thing left where rich, poor, north, south, east, west, every country can still say, you can come in, you cannot come in. And there's no guaranteed enforceable overarching treaty that makes you accept people. Yeah. So when we talk about this climate migration, climate refugee challenge that the world faces, we cannot say that you know the state or the United Nations or the multilateral system is going to be able to cope with this. This has to be something much bigger, but we do have to revisit how we modify sovereignty. And, and what I advocate in the book is that we think about stewardship. What is the responsibility of a country that possesses and governs a specific territory? What is their obligation morally, potentially legally? What are the incentives that we can offer to Russia and to Canada to support them in the process of absorbing the cost of absorbing more people. And those are the kinds of conversations we need to be having. And some of the leaders in this are civil society organizations. The International Union for the Conservation of Nature, IUCN, works very closely with governments to create ecological preserves and to help them generate the capital and bring in the technical assistance to actually do these things because they don't have the capacity to do it on their own. And you also write in, in your book about uh, just the perception that people have about themselves. So we have uh, still, you know, you, we all have passports of our countries of, of, of origin, um, but the identity that people hold aren't necessarily bound to, um, to your country, to your passport anymore. Identities are increasingly more complex, especially if we look at younger generations. Yes. And I'm glad you highlighted the younger generation. For me, that's a big focus in the book. If you want to forecast the future of human geography, you need to be uh, precise about which humans you are talking about, because older people will not be alive in 2050. We need to look at the world's youth of today. And the youth of today are a particular multi-generational cohort of about four to five billion people. Today's young people are the future, of course. They will occupy the world. Where they go will determine the winners and the losers of the remainder of this century. And where they are moving is dictated or will be dictated more and more by climate and less and less by national loyalty. And this is one of the themes that I flesh out in the book, looking at this idea of a horizontal generational consciousness in which sustainability, mobility, connectivity, these are the three cardinal virtues, if you will, 
amongst that is that are common among young people in the world. And what I have found is that young people don't want to serve. You know, they don't want to do military conscription. Right. Uh, you know, they don't want to uh, pay high taxes unless they're getting something for it. And they want to have the right to be mobile, irrespective of what their nationality is. And we have the technology today to allow people to um, uh, upload to the blockchain their educational certifications, their travel history, their vaccination records, criminal history in a way that is safe and secure. And so that countries can not rather than penalize people for being a citizen of uh, you know, Sudan or Nigeria or Bolivia, instead say, well, who are you as an individual? What is your skill? What are you know? What? Why are you coming? What do you want? Are you a legitimate person? Is there anything that we need to be concerned about? We can be transparent at an individual level and no longer penalize people by their nationality and instead welcome them based on their individual uh, identity and credentials. And that idea really blew my mind uh, in, in the book that I hadn't thought about before. And it's an obvious uh, application of, of blockchain technology of actually having a non-national passport uh, where, as you mentioned, you, you are uh, rated by your general skills or who you are rather than just a blanket statement of your nationality. And uh, it also didn't occur to me what you mentioned in the book, Uh, that the idea of a national passport that allows you freedom of travel is actually rather new, that this didn't occur before this uh, First World War. That's exactly right. So historically, passports are a very you know, relatively new invention. Prior to that, when you had an identity card by a government, it was uh, what's you know known as a laissez-passer, right? Simply a request for uh, peaceful transit. And that was honored in most cases. But again, we have a much larger world population today. We have sovereignty. We have the bureaucratization of migration in a very significant way. So we've built up these protocols and restrictions that have made it very, very difficult. And the irony being, of course, Simon, that this is precisely the time when we need to enable more migration, not only because of climate change, but actually because of labor shortages. And throughout the 20th century, in addition to the stories that we know and the drivers that we know, political persecution and conflict and war, we think of that as being a major driver of, uh, of, of uh, you know, human migration in the 20th century. But in fact, the largest driver of migration is economic migration. We are all fundamentally economic migrants, and that's generally proceeded relatively peacefully. If you think about Eastern Europeans and particularly the Turkish population in Europe, if you think about the Latino population in the United States, Asians in the United States, South Asians in the Persian Gulf countries, hundreds of millions of people peacefully migrated in the 20th century. And tens of millions of people have continued to peacefully migrate since the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, 30 years ago. We have had most migration has actually been peaceful and not driven by genocide, not driven by war. And very often people forget that because they portray migration or mass migration as some kind of a sudden, shocking, overwhelming and violent force. But the vast majority of human migration of the past 100,000 years has not been that. It has been peaceful. It has been mutually beneficial. It has been orderly. And I think we need to remember that because we need it more than ever. And so when we talk about this orderly migration and, you know, countries like I live in Australia, um, an immigrant nation where we take in more migrants in order to, you know, have a large enough working population that can finance the retired uh, population. Uh, the big criticism that always pops up is, and I'll share one of uh, the charts that you that you have in your book about this, um, is that people say, we are uh, we are full. <laughs> the world is is risking overpopulation and uh, that just leads to more and more catastrophes if we have more people. But if we look at this chart that you shared of global um, population, we do get the sense that overpopulation might not be the biggest problem that we're facing. And, and Simon, this is truly an equivalently devastating chart to that first map, because 
on you know that one was showing just how radical our shift in human geography may need to be this is showing how what a radical departure from our demographic forecasts of the past decades we are actually heading into now this would be if if people ask me what have we been most wrong about you know people have said things like you know china would become a democratic uh, country simply because it became a member of the international economic community wrong well we were even more wrong about this because china at least became capitalist but you and i can remember when we were younger that the global demographic forecasts were malthusian right people said we will have a population of 15 billion people that is too many mouths to feed and there will be state collapse and resource stress and so forth but look at this chart you know, the world population will probably not even reach 9 billion people 9 billion people is still a lot of people the world population quadrupled in the course of the 20th century and that of course has created very significant resource stress but can we as a human species absorb and redistribute 9 billion people in a more sensible way than the current map of nation states and borders? And the answer, of course, is yes. So the psychological impact of this chart is meant to show that we don't need to fear, you know, Malthusian overpopulation. Instead, we are heading for what I call peak humanity. Right. We will reach peak humanity pro probably by 2035, before 2040, the maximum number of human beings that will ever have lived at the same time. And therefore, we will start to adopt a new psychology in which rather than sort of us versus them, you know, winners and losers, north and south, we might start to say, wait a minute, we need to preserve our species we are actually heading into decline as a human species and we are accelerating it through all of our um, you know sort of ignoring environmental externalities and you know rapid climate change we could be creating mass extinction events that is not good for our survival as a species what can we do to maximize our survival and that will require of course a much larger scale human resettlement and when we're thinking about the new population size, all of a sudden we get to scenarios where at the moment we just think about we need to build more cities. We need to build uh, so many more you know, settlements in order to, to house a billion more people in just a couple of decades, really. So that's still a big challenge that, that we are facing, particularly if we get people out of poverty into cities. So there's still a lot of construction uh, that will need to happen over the next couple of decades. But if we if we look ahead to the 2050s, uh, the 2060s, when we will actually see this decline of population, there will of course still be cities, I assume, that are growing, but certain cities will be, you know, abandoned or, or just shrink down to size. And that must be a whole new challenge for humanity, wouldn't it be? It's such a brilliant and complex you know, question and uh, area to investigate because you're talking about urbanization, demographics, climate change, and other forces at the same time. And so the, the, the answer, if you will, is that it depends on where you are looking at and what the conditions and scenarios wind up being. Because if you bring climate change under control and you prevent uh, accelerated sea level rise, then maybe some of today's coastal mega cities like Jakarta or wherever will not have to be abandoned. Maybe people can stay in them. Maybe the new capital city uh, in Indonesia does not have to be built. On the present trajectory, yes, it would. Now, look at Tokyo. Tokyo is a climate resilient area. You know, it's sort of on the island fortress of Honshu Island. It has been the largest city in the world by population up until just the past decade when the mega urban cluster of the Pearl River Delta, now called the Greater Bay Area in southern China, replaced it. But of the mega cities of the world, only Tokyo is declining in population. But because Japan is a relatively speaking a climate oasis, the term I use for some of these propitious geographies in the book, Japan could absorb more people. Now, we tend to think of Japan as a very insular culture that is not pro-immigration. But one of the things that I've reported on is that you actually have a larger foreign population in Japan today than ever in history. There are three million non-Japanese people living in Japan. So what if 
Japanese policy evolves and adapts and they continue to absorb more people, that could replenish the population of Tokyo. And then there's the going back to Russia and Canada, right? And, uh, you know, Scandinavia and so forth. Of course, towns that are there will expand. New cities will be built. But then we have to factor in, again, the element of the turbulence in the environment, right? I, I argue that we don't want to simply build Frankfurt, uh, you know, in the Arctic, right? You know, what we want is a new kind of architectural design. We want mobile infrastructure, movable infrastructure, and we want it to be circular, meaning self-sufficient, right? We want to have wastewater recycling, we want to have solar power, we want to have hydroponic uh, agriculture and these kinds of things. And maybe even given climatic instability, we want people to be able to move again. So I, I conclude you know, by saying that rather than uh, simply a north to south movement in a linear fashion, what will happen is that mankind and many you know, billions of people may need to become more nomadic again and become sort of, you know, uh, wandering and, you know, taking our infrastructure with us. And again, the amazing thing is that we have these technologies today. We are developing them at breakneck pace. And if one wants to be optimistic about the world, it would hinge on some of these technologies and then more cautiously on our psychological evolution that we would start to enable people to be more circular as a survival mechanism. You know, human beings have a fight or flight instinct right? Fight or flight has governed our movement for 100,000 years. And only in the last couple of thousand years have many societies become more sedentary. But we can embrace our inner nomadism again. And more and more people do this. And I know this from many people in my generation. Oh, I uh, did my uh, Abitur, my high school graduation in, in Munich. And out of my 80 classmates or thereabouts. It is shocking to see how many people live across the globe. People live from Beijing to New York to Melbourne uh, to Spain to Portugal. People just moved to different uh, corners of the globe and it becomes natural because you scan the globe for your lifestyle situation and also people don't move to Beijing forever. They know that this is a stage in their career and then maybe once kids are um, uh, you know, enter the picture, then you change your uh, change your strategy a bit. But we are hyper mobile, at least the let's call it the rich and the poor end of the spectrum are very mobile. But what would you do um, if you are a mayor of a big city like Sydney or Melbourne in Australia that are at risk of getting warmer, that are at risk of high sea levels, you know, the city will stay there in some way or form and you are supposed to um, you know to prepare for a prosperous future what are the big picture strategies that you would suggest to those to those mayors right great question so if you are the mayor of a coastal large city a desirable mi magnet both for domestic migrants because of course talented australians move to sydney and melbourne in the same way that talented british people move to london but of course, you are also climate vulnerable. You need to be planning ahead and, and you know, building new infrastructure that is more inland and upland, right? So away from the sea and at higher elevation so, so that you can absorb you know, the climate retreat, if you will, from the coast. In the Australian case, you also have to be thinking about fresh water supply because you have significant droughts as well. So you need to be investing a lot in the irrigation infrastructure and in the hydrological infrastructure. So water conservation, water recycling, water channeling, all of these kinds of things, water basin management, reservoir management. And as you know, in Australia, there's a you're a bit behind in this. Now, not far behind in the sense that a rich country cannot rapidly do these things because Australia fortunately is a very wealthy country and can. But you do look at the droughts in Australia and some of the um, challenges of affordable housing in the big cities like Sydney and Melbourne. And you say, wait a minute, why didn't they do this five years ago, 10 years ago, with federal support, with provincial support, with the city budgets? Um, and, you know, local micro day to day concerns can very often outweigh seeing the big picture. But the more tragic, you know, these annual climatic disasters become, whether it's the fires in California or Australia and elsewhere, the more I think that we will 
belatedly, but hopefully not too late, uh, come to the realization that this must be the focus. This is what our economy needs to be about, right, in a way. And uh, so, you know, on the one hand, it's a survival economy, but on the other hand, it is long term strategy. And so we say in infrastructure, you know, there's just this uh, general truism that infrastructure follows and very seldom infrastructure leads. And we, we see, uh, you know, the climate catastrophe facing us. Uh, but who's willing to pay for infrastructure that leads this way if we got so many uh, present day uh, concerns? You know, we have traffic bottlenecks. We need a new uh, suburban loop, uh, railway, all these kind of things that all costs a lot of money. So why would I invest into big infrastructure? How how can I actually afford this politically speaking? Well, this isn't necessarily big infrastructure, right? You know, resilient, mobile, light footprint infrastructure, like the movable cities that I'm talking about, is cheaper than building giant skyscrapers that are not going to be occupied in a world of remote work, you know, and uh, things like this. So actually thinking about the latest technologies, right? You know, again, solar power is cheaper than building huge new electricity grids built on fossil fuel. So this is cheaper. And of course, it's a financial opportunity in two senses. Number one, why would you continue to finance stranded assets, right? Sunken coastal infrastructure, oil pipelines, these are not gonna make you money in the future in a world where there's enormous fiduciary and regulatory pressure to not use them. Secondly, it's a profit motive because people will want to move to climate resilient areas and live more sustainable lives and be more off grid. And so if you are a first mover in that economic space and that opportunity, that is something that you should want to embrace. So in fact, Simon, I see the incentives aligning towards uh, financing this more positive model of a mobile uh, civilization, if you will, rather than being on the hook for trillions of dollars of stranded assets. And you can, this is not a hypothetical. In China right now, which is for all intents and purposes, the largest economy in the world, they do have a major stranded asset dilemma. Yeah. And that's actually encouraging a shift of capital into more renewables in uh, various uh, asset classes. And so when, when I talk to big institutional investors, we're talking about people that invest billions of dollars and they are tasked because money is cheap at the moment uh, to buy up, to create infrastructure investments. Uh, those guys are really looking for the next big thing to build. So would right now be a good point to actually benefit from, from you know, the crazy amounts of money that are floating around the planet to actually start building future infrastructure? Absolutely. So new models of, um, of, uh, of housing, you know, affordable housing, sustainable housing, uh, you know, what I call kind of, again, circular settlements, if you will, people will immediately flock to them, right? Because of the frustration and the, again, the cost of energy inputs, the, the vulnerability of our energy grids, uh, the concerns about fresh water supply, all of these are motivating factors. So actually, as you say, infrastructure tends to follow, but some of the successful economic models of recent decades, China and the Persian Gulf countries have actually been supply led growth infrastructure led growth and of course it's the the the, the uh, non-economic way to phrase it is the famous line from the movie field of dreams uh if you build it they will come and that actually works when you use the knowledge that we have and the gis mapping capabilities to say look we know that these geographies are going to be more stable and propitious we want to cultivate them and allow people to live in those places but without trampling on the environment. There are construction and building models and there are economic models that are more circular that could be could deploy in these greenfield areas. Let's invest in that. And that is, again, the right thing to do. It requires five to 10 years of planning. The technology is, is available and it will be profitable. And so in a world where, you know, there is so much movement happening, um, economic pressures lead some people, or opportunities uh, lead some people to move here. Some people leave an area for climate change. It just means there's this big uh, mixture. You know, you really reshuffle the global population. Two new corners, you mix people from different backgrounds in single, or in new cities, in new countries. Um, 
we then have this big issue about what do we do with them? How do we create a, a national, a regional identity uh, assimilation? What What is the goal here? And you really mentioned in your book the uh, the example of the French uh, hijab ban as an, as an assimilation effort. Uh, can you talk a bit about what the big future perspective here is in order to make sure that we can live uh, alongside just just fine? Sure. Well, you know, cities, especially global cities, are already the best demonstration and case study we already have of how we are not predisposed genetically or ethnographically, anthropologically to be tribal per se, because people move precisely to Toronto and Sydney and New York and Los Angeles and London and Berlin and Hong Kong and Singapore. These are the melting pot cities in Dubai, of course. These are all cities. Notice the leading economic centers of the world, the most powerful and radiant role models of urban life today are also the places that are the most racially diverse, that are open to all, from all walks of life, from every corner of the world. Look at how London, the city of London and the voters in the city of London opposed Brexit, for example, because they think in a colorblind way about talent, right? And the history of America, of course, for more than 200 years has been this story. So there's no question that being open to racial and you know diversity and encouraging genetic intermingling is the way to go. You look at a country like Singapore, where I live, it has the highest rate of interracial marriage in the world because you have Chinese and Indians and others side by side. There is a new race that has existed in Singapore for the last, uh, you know, well, a couple of centuries, but even more now, which is the Chindians, when Chinese marry Indians. Where else are you going to have so many Chinese and Indians living in the same country such that over the generations, they voluntarily, of course, not forced, they voluntarily intermarry. So the fact is that I don't need to make the case that there is some immutable notion of a national identity that is being offended by the process of migration of foreigners. All of human history is the migration of people and the intermingling of their bloodlines in almost everywhere in the world, except for uh, you know Japan, parts of China, and uh, you know and other pure nation states like Bangladesh and others. But for the Western world, when we talk about France and we talk about you know Western Europe in general, certainly the UK, obviously America and Canada. Uh, hardly need to say it, you know, there is much more historical over thousands of years, over centuries, and in the last couple of decades of this intermingling uh, than we've had before. So the question is not what is the national identity in the sense of linked to ethnographic, you know, rooted nationality, rather, what is the civic identity that a place wishes to promote? And in a country like uh, uh, Switzerland or France, if they've banned headscarves, or in the case of the Netherlands, where they have a very strict language adoption policy, you cannot become a Dutch citizen unless you really learn to speak fluent Dutch. Um, these are democratic societies. They have every right to say that we have a vision for what a civic, a common civic identity is to be a fully participating member of this society so that you are not self ostracizing, not ghettoizing. And we seek as best as possible to, you know, let people in from wherever they're from, but we need you to conform. We're not imposing Christianity on these migrants, right? We're simply saying that, you know, it, we need to condition people and shape people in a way not to become French like a Caucasian, like a French person, right? Not to become Swedish, but something new, something that is accommodating of this greater diversity. As you know very well in Germany, this is very evolved in the country that is as well as any other identified with the idea of an ethnic notion of the nation state and national identity. There is a very rich conversation about die Neuen Deutschen, right? The new Germans. And it doesn't just mean Turks. Uh, anymore. It means all manner of migrants and how they become the new Germans. And they don't become the new Germans, you know, because they will eat sausage and drink beer and, you know, go to soccer games, right? They become the new Germans because they participate in civic life and they speak the language and they settle down and they raise their children in local schools, not in a parallel, uh, you know, administrative or educational or cultural infrastructure. And Germanness changes 
along the way. And that's what we want to see. Canadian ness has changed. American ness has changed. German ness has changed. So again, you know, the best examples around the world from large and important countries actually show us that we are doing this. This is not a hypothetical question for the future, and it's not some great looming risk that is a threat to our identity. We are already deeply, we are one century into a process of succeeding at having more integrated societies that can, in fact, be stable, be peaceful, be harmonious. And you, you also described that there is, particularly with the idea of, you know, how much do I identify with my nation based on, you know, this is my place of birth. Uh, there is a link by generation. This seems to, to weaken. And this might be uh, through the exposure of younger generations are more exposed to other people. They were more exposed growing up to uh, culture through their smartphones and the Internet uh, from other places. And so the the national identity slowly crumbles uh, away. Or it's again replaced and it's modified and it's uh, diluted or and absorbed into something broader, into something richer, into something more appropriate to our times. And when I talk to young uh, people, high school students, you know, voters, even politicians in Scandinavia and elsewhere, of course they have a very strong sense of their national identity for many, many, many centuries. And so they are also the ones saying, look, but they're, they're young, so they've grown up in culturally diverse countries. They, they know that the nannies and caregivers they had, teachers at school, taxi drivers, cooks, you know, and the kebab is what they eat as a snack nowadays and all of this kind of stuff. They're not saying, let us deport all migrants. They're saying, hold on, we feel a very genuine cosmopolitan sympathy with the troubled uh, populations of the world, we do need to play our part in uh, you know, population resettlement from a humanitarian climate standpoint. But we also need to preserve a certain sense of order and stability because how desirable a place will we be if we collapse under the weight of unassimilated populations? Now, could they move faster in this? Could they be more generous and take more in numbers in? Yes, they could. But this is the nature of democracy in an intergenerational context at a time of low growth and scarce, you know, fiscal uh, room for maneuver. And we have to accept that. And, you know, if you look at uh, Angela Merkel in Germany, right, a society that has been cautious about migration, she got them to accept more than one million migrants. Then it, the number came back down again as a political compromise. But it has not shut down. Right. Germany is becoming more and more and more diverse. The Africans and the Turks and the Persians and even the Indian populations and Chinese. It is all growing and growing and growing. So we get there eventually. Awesome. But it also shows the importance of the national uh, and national is probably the wrong word in this context, but the national conversation about what you actually value. What does it mean to be a German is, is, in, is a question that has always been asked for, for a long time. And once you let go of the blood and soil idea of what it means to be German, uh, then you actually think about your own values. And it's not easy if you do this on a personal level to decide what you actually value. If you spend five minutes thinking about this, it's terribly difficult to find out what you actually care about. And then putting this discussion on a national level becomes even more complex, doesn't it? And we should not actually let the lowest common denominator shape our view on this issue from a long term standpoint, because this is an issue where there are winners and losers. Going back to our first point, you are free in your country, whatever it may be, to reject foreigners, to reject migrants, to reject talent. But then you will also become a place where emigration supersedes immigration and you will be a loser. No one wants to go to Hungary. No one wants to go to Bulgaria. Is that our standard? Is that the benchmark that you and I are using? Of course not. Let them lose and let them regret it and let them learn. Because Italy is a perfect case study here. Italy has been losing its talented uh, you know, um, uh, youth, whether it is male or female. The Five Star Movement has a practically a regressive view of the role of the woman in society and simply wants them to become birth engines. And so talented Italian women are saying, I'm out of here. And guess what happens? The five star movement loses 
right, in the election. So let countries go through that learning process. It's a pity if they do not have the foresight and the wisdom to see that in the end, you should allow supply and demand of people to dictate these flows rather than some kind of cultural inhibitions. But a country like Germany, despite the uh, cultural caution that many people in the society have, has nonetheless moved forward. When I lived in Germany as a teenager, the NPD was a threat. The NPD doesn't exist anymore. Three years ago, when I was living in Berlin, the AFD is uh, the you know what everyone talked about. The AFD is not going to be taking over the German government in the year 2021. So let's remember that pragmatism ultimately prevails. If you look at the United States under Biden, they are going back to an expansion of immigration and uh, normalizing the status of illegal immigrants. If you look at England, it is easier today to migrate to England in 2021 than it was in 2015. If Brexit was a vote against you know, openness right, of uh, borders and boundaries, then it failed spectacularly because in 2021 it's easier now because they learned the hard way talent flight, capital flight, and uh, industrial exodus, and they realized, oh my God, now we have shortages of doctors and nurses and other workers in our society. It's now wide open, right? Come one, come all. So we all learn either, the, either through foresight or through mistakes. So if we take all of this together that we, that we spoke about, um, I want to come to the to the last map, and it's a map that probably uh, is very familiar to most people. It just shows the population distribution as of right now, global population distribution. But in you know what will how would this change this view of the world over the next couple of decades? Well, there's you know a couple of things about this that I think are really really important. The first is we are eight billion people, right? Each of us is a pixel on this map, and this is where we are effectively in real time. And in fact, we know that quite well because 2020, 2021 have witnessed the lowest rates of international movement and migration in decades because of the COVID lockdown. So here we are now, but given what we discussed earlier, the world population is reaching a plateau. So imagine you had to rearrange these pixels in a finite world population to say, well, how would we optimize our uh, species, right? Our numbers, how would we potentially even uh, regain the confidence to have higher fertility levels? And if you think about climate change in the first map, you know, where should people go to live a sustainable life in which they're not struggling for water and food and other basics like energy and so forth, you would move people around more, right? And, 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 uh, and that is the challenge is if you take 8 billion people and 150 million square kilometers of land, and you think about what are the geographies that are habitable sustainably for those 8 billion people, you would move billions of people from where they are now to where they need to be. And of course, you would look at the depopulated areas that are climate oases, like northern, much of uh, Eurasia, northern Eurasia, and much of uh, North America, and you would start to recirculate people in an orderly uh, fashion. Of course, that's not what's going to happen. You know, in the book, I, I have four scenarios, and three of them are, quite frankly, right, relatively negative, right? And they are, they are painful transitions or the status quo which is very, very unfortunate that three of the four scenarios you know, that, I, that I discuss in the book are, are not the ones where we get this right. But what's also interesting is some of the hope that I see in the new vectors and directions of migration. Because if you take, for example, um, you know, the last 30 years, most migration has been within regions, Europeans within Europe, Southeast Asians within Southeast Asia, Africans within Africa, and so forth. But what's already happening, and we were kind of alluding to this earlier, you see more Southern Asians and East Asians in Russia and Central Asia. You see more Southern Asians and East Asians migrating across to Europe, right? You have ever more Asians in North America. In 2019, Canada took in more Indians than the United States did, in fact, and it has one tenth the population of the United States. So you actually have these new vectors, large numbers of people that are in fact moving and on the move. And that began before the pandemic, 
for economic reasons, political reasons, and otherwise. And I do believe that it will continue in the future. So I'm hopeful, again, that we can do this in a peaceful fashion, in a mutually beneficial fashion, in a sustainable fashion. But we have to actually, I know you and I will agree, to change our mindsets, to change our psychology, there's nothing like a map, right? A map that really is, you know, shows you the future. And it makes it so much more digestible and palatable to absorb the lesson. This is what you must do. You cannot fight against geography, right? And I think that is that is ultimately the power of maps. It shows us where we can be, but it also shows us what we should not fight against. Oh, I like this an awful lot as a, a you know as a, a concluding remark. And I'll, I'll thank you so much for, for sharing this, uh, you know, and I genuinely uh, like your book. You know, I, I read this way before uh, we actually talked about doing this talk, um, simply because I can't resist a book uh, that features a couple of maps. So uh, thank you for being very mappy uh, in all of in all of your writing and uh, great chatting with you today. Thank you so much, Simon. Thank you for being such an oracle of cartography. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. So I reckon, um, you know, we stayed within an hour, which is, uh, you know, approximate. I think you can't go longer than an hour.